Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear viewers all around the world, Ramadan Kareem. Welcome to Spiritual Conversations. Alhamdulillah. I'm your host today, Neil Nasser, and it's my honor to be joined by the, the one, the only, Sayyid Muhammad Barakah Kazwini. Assalamu alaikum, Sayyidna. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I congratulate you and our dear viewers on the beautiful month of Ramadan. Asantum. Thank you so much. It's an honor to have you on today's show. And our discussion today is going to be a really interesting one. So our title, dear viewers, is How Do We Introduce Islam to Non-Muslims? A very interesting title and something that we can all benefit and learn from because, alhamdulillah, living in the West, we're interacting with non-Muslims all the time. I myself am a revert. I came to Islam about 10 years ago. And I had some beautiful brothers and sisters that introduced the amazing religion to me. Um, so it's a really good topic. Sayyidna, what's your sort of starting points on this topic? Before I start with my experience and with my points, I'm interested to ask you, Brother Neil, how were you introduced to the religion of Islam first? Do you mind sharing that experience with us? Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for giving me the platform to do that. So I was introduced, um, it was actually the passing of my grandmother that brought me to a mosque. Um, my father is Khoja, East African, and my mother is English. And through that experience, I was, um, unfortunately, my mother and father divorced when I was young. So I didn't have much connection with my father's side of the family. But when the grandmother died, Around about 10 or 11 years ago, it brought me to the mosque to, to pay my respects. And I noticed a few things within the mosque. Firstly and foremost, I noticed a beautiful hadith from Amir Mugmaneen alayhi salam that says the stars only shine in the darkest places. Now, a few days before, I was speaking at a young offenders institution and I was telling them exactly the same quote and I attributed it to Rumi not knowing this was Amir Mu'mineen alayhi salam, Imam Ali. And so I thought that really struck me, like, why is this person using Rumi's quote? And I'm quite an inquisitive person, I like to read. The second thing that struck me is that I met all my family who I haven't met for quite some time, and they were all praying in Jama'at. And it was so beautiful. I've, I've done a lot of meditation, I've traveled, I've been to the Far East, and I've studied with monks, etc. And I felt this serenity that was surrounded when people were praying it was like this equality so there were two things connecting with the family and the quote from Salam. that was my gateway in literally my cousins and family my brothers and sisters they were showing me lectures amazing people like so That's and, uh, fascinating. And I learned more religion for boring than. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. That's very fascinating to hear. So, coming to the mosque for you was extremely instrumental in introducing you to the religion of Islam and to know figures like Imam Ali, peace be upon him. Yes, definitely. That was my turning point, literally understanding, reading the stories of his amazing life, um, you know, the, the, how he lifted the doors of Khaybar, and then half an hour later, he couldn't even mm -hmm. break bread, dry bread. He attributed that to God, and then the food was for the dunya. So that was like phenomenal to me. I've always studied martial arts, and then we come to find out that when uh, they tried to kill the Prophet, peace be upon him, they couldn't get to him because he was too protected. And uh, they couldn't get to Amir Mu'minim because he could see 360 degrees on the battlefield. Now, these things resonate with somebody that studies martial arts because that's what we're taught to do, have a heightened state of awareness um, and, and make sure you're defending yourself all the time. So then we come to learn, alhamdulillah, that you know, Imam Ali alayhi salam, has all these attributes plus so much more. He would work in the fields all day, planting trees, digging wells, and then he would come home to his wife and he would grind flour with her and share the chores. And to me, this is the kind of attributes that I, I saw growing up, um, growing up with my mother, and it really felt, it really put a place in my heart. Um, so yeah, alhamdulillah. 
Alhamdulillah. Thank you for sharing that. We really appreciate it. It's always good to hear from those who have embraced the religion of Islam. What is it that attracted them or what is it that introduced them to this beautiful religion? I will share with you some points based on my personal experience in introducing Islam to non-Muslims. Many non-Muslims, I would say the majority of non-Muslims in the world, um, do not know the very basics and fundamentals of the religion of Islam. It's very important to clarify these points to them whenever you speak to them, whenever you encounter them. If you have a friend, you have a colleague, um, someone that no notices you're a Muslim and they're interested to know, don't assume that they know what Islam is. My experience has demonstrated and, and studies have also shown that most non-Muslims do not know what Islam is, where does it even fit in the picture of global religions, Abrahamic religions. And in fact, a lot of non-Muslims, for them, Islam and being Arab is synonymous. Mm. I myself, I've encountered Americans, American non-Muslims, who couldn't tell the difference between Islam and being Arab, a Muslim and an Arab. To that extent, many non-Muslims do not know what Islam is. So it's very important to start with the basics. And, and this is how I would start. I have found this to be very effective. So I would inform our fellow non-Muslim uh, citizens in our society that Islam is a continuation of the Abrahamic faiths. Islam is not a new religion in the sense that it came from nothing. Islam is a continuation of the message of previous prophets. Mm -hmm. We as Muslims recognize all the Abrahamic faiths, such as Judaism, Christianity, the prophets who were sent to these people. Islam is a continuation of that. That's why the Holy Quran speaks of scriptures like the gospel that was revealed to Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, or the Torah that was revealed to Prophet Moses. It's very important for, for non-Muslims to see where Islam fits in the picture here. You have a monotheistic religion that is a continuation of previous faiths. It's more comprehensive. It did not come to abolish them in the sense that it came to reject those values. Of course not. It came to build on them, to take, to take it a step further, and also to correct what had been changed throughout history. That's a fundamental point that many non-Muslims are not aware of. Yes, definitely. Definitely. I think that's a very good stage process in the, in the way that you can introduce it. To, because most people, uh, non-Muslims, will understand Christianity. They will understand Judaism. And they may have some naivety when it comes to Islam. Because it's not painted so well in, in the media. So if you're watching a movie, for instance, Islam is shown to be in quite a negative light in some aspects. Um, in fact, some non-Muslims, Brother Neil, they would think Islam is a cult. They don't sent. know that Islam has any connection with the Abrahamic faiths. Yes, that's right. That's right. And I think that's what you're doing there. It's almost like you're putting that jigsaw together so you can show that they are. there is a connection between A and B and C. And this is the final message, the final prophet, and alhamdulillah, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, came to give us the haq, the truth. Just to demonstrate this point out of personal experience, once I was at a church in Canada, and I was speaking about Prophet Muhammad's hadith on Jesus, peace be upon them all. So what did our Prophet say about Isa, peace be upon him? They were extremely shocked to know that Islam had anything to say about Jesus. In fact, in fact, one of them asked me, your prophet has all these statements about Jesus? Why? What's his connection with, why is he interested in Jesus? <laughs> Can you imagine a very good observant churchgoer who spent decades in the church asked me, why would your prophet be interested in Jesus? A lot of non-Muslims are not aware that the Prophet Muhammad is a continuation of Jesus. He would consider those prophets his brothers. 
and yes. he has so much respect for them. So, mm. like you said, you know, um, f- f- completing that puzzle for the people, making that connection for non-Muslims is extremely key in starting a proper foundation to dis- to discuss Islam with them. Yes, definitely. I think what people um, would come to find after knowing such information is that, for instance, if they were to look at the Holy Quran, uh, the blessed book, they would see all the prophets named within that book. Surprisingly, when I've spoken to Christians, um, believers, saying to them that we believe in Jesus and Jesus, we take us the prophet Isa. And were they aware that his mother, Maryam, is mentioned more times in the Quran than in the Bible? And this is quite intriguing for them. And then there are some great stories that literally they, they, can, they continue on. I, I, I present Islam in a way that Allah has created a trilogy of books. The Torah, the, the Bible, and the Quran. And if you read through all the books, and alhamdulillah, I've been lucky enough to read all through the books, there's overarching messages within each book. And, and it's, it, they're constant reminders. Absolutely. So it's very important to start with the basics. And also it's important to um, highlight the fact that Islam is a universal religion. It's not an Arab religion. Many non-Muslims are under the impression that this is an Arab religion. So it's important to make that distinction. Islam is a religion. Being Arab is an ethnicity. Some call it a race. Mm -hmm. And most Muslims today are not Arab. 80%, 80% of Muslims are not Arab. Non-Muslims need to hear that. They need to know that. That Mm -hmm. demonstrates to them how universal um, the message of Islam is. Because honestly, many of them do think that this is an Arab religion. So clearing these basics um, and addressing these misconceptions, I think it's very, very key. Now let's take it to the next step. Once we have introduced Islam to them at a very basic level for them to know where Islam fits in the overall picture of religions, then we have to um, effectively communicate our beliefs to them. Okay, so I understand that Islam is a continuation of these previous religions. So tell us, what do you believe in? And what's special about this religion? And over here, we have so much to explore. And it's truly fascinating what Islam has to offer. And here, I would like to highlight the role of Imam Ali salam because you mentioned Imam Ali and his quotes are what truly attracted you to the religion of Islam. Uh, recently, Brother Neil, Brother Neil, I was uh, with a delegation of, of Christian um, scholars and leaders here in Najaf, and we were discussing Imam Ali, his justice, his method of governance, and one hadith that really struck them, and some of them were scholars, you know, they had examined Islam for, for decades, but they had mm. never come across these gems from Imam Ali, alayhi salam. Um, the beautiful hadith from Imam Ali salam states, If I had the full power, meaning if people would allow me to rule, you know, uh, and, and not wage so many wars against me and stop me from ruling, how would I rule? The Imam Ali salam states, if I had the power to rule, I would rule the people of the Torah according to their Torah. And I would rule the people of the Injil, the Evangel or the Gospel, according to the Bible. And I would rule the people of Quran according to the Quran. SubhanAllah. It's very important for non-Muslims to see how Islam promotes interfaith dialogue. And Mm -hmm. how Islam gave freedom to these different religions. How Prophet Muhammad offered them protection. So if you're trying to introduce Islam to a non-Muslim, tell them that my prophet, the first thing that he did when he went to Medina, and now he finally had the freedom to establish a community, he established a constitution with the people of the book, specifically the Jews. And that's Mm -hmm. called the Charter of Medina. The Charter of Medina extended protection to the Jewish people at the time, such that the prophet considered them part of one nation, We are citizens of one community. 
And if yeah. someone attacks you, it's an attack on us. If someone attacks us, it's an attack on you. You practice your religion, we practice our religion. It's very important for non-Muslims to look at the tolerance of the religion of Islam and how Islam gave these different um, faiths the, the, the freedom to practice their religion. And, and that's the first thing our Prophet did really um, in terms of interfaith work when he arrived in Medina. That's a great way to start your introduction of Islam to non-Muslims. Yes, definitely. It's a, you've got to try to find the, the language of the person that you're speaking to and allow it to fit in, in, in terms of what maybe their belief system is, maybe their, you know, what their attributes are, maybe their culture or the way that they have, have uh, fit in into society. Now, it can be in so many different ways. And, and Amir Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, has so many, like you say, say in the gems. And I think that they can always be attributed in some way, shape, or form. Like the, the hadith that I said right at the beginning of the show, the stars only shine in the darkest places. If you imagine, I was using that hadith to young offenders in a prison setting that had, you know, gone on straight on the wrong path. And I was trying to help them to see that they may be in a dark place at that time, but what they have to do is try to believe in themselves and look up because they will see the light. They will see that light. Now, if you think, I didn't even realize that that was Imam Ali at the time, but I understood the hadith. So what I'm saying, um, the point I'm making here is the fact that there are so many gems from Amir Mu'mineen and from the Ahlul Bayt Salam and the Prophet, peace be upon him, that we can use in the right situation and make it applicable to the circumstances or the person that is in front of us. Wonderful thoughts, uh, thoughts uh, Brother Neil. Let's now move to the third point in, when we are introducing Islam to non-Muslims. Uh, Islam, if I want to borrow contemporary language that people are familiar with, Islam is truly a work of art. Mm -hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the universe. You mentioned the stars, right? You can see the, the stars in the darkest you know, uh, part of the night. When you look at that night sky, you truly see a work of art because the creation of Allah is beautiful. Now, just as God's creation is beautiful in the physical realm of existence, it's also beautiful in the religious and spiritual and legal dimensions as well. So when you look at Islam, it's truly a piece of art. It's so comprehensive. It guides you every step of the way in your life such that you truly feel, my Lord is with me. You know, there are some people who are bothered by Islam having so many recommendations, so many laws, so many rulings, so many teachings. Um, I, I've heard, I've heard some, from some youth, they were complaining. Like Islam even tells you it's recommended if you're going into the masjid, go with your right foot. Start with your right foot. And if mm -hmm. you're going to the bathroom, go with your left foot. Come on. Why is this religion, you know, um, meddling with my business and <laughs> shoving itself into every detail of life? Uh, you know, my, my response to that uh, Brother Neil, is when you have a manufacturer, a company, who creates a beautiful product for you, but that product is sophisticated because it's a very powerful, important product. Don't they give you a manual on how to operate it? You'll see the manual very detailed. You know, sometimes your washing machine, your dryer, your fridge, whatever it is, they come with books that are 50 pages, 100 pages. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, we don't read those, you know, <laughs> the technicians, you know, that's their job to figure that out. But why does the company give you that? It's their obligation to tell you everything about this product. We are the product of God. Peace. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a manual. I created you. I know what's good for you. I will guide you every step of the way. I won't force you. It's up to you to accept my guidance or not. But here is my guidance. Islam is truly a work of art. Let me give you some examples. For instance, Islam is a religion that connects you with nature through the times of prayer. See, today we have our watches and clocks, and we don't even know what's going on outside, but we know it's the time for prayer. But historically, how did people figure out the times of prayer? By the sun, the moon, the stars. Yeah. Right? 
How do you know it's yeah. Fajr time? You see that white light, you know, from the eastern horizon. Then you have sunrise, your prayer is expired. It becomes qada. And then noon is when the sun reaches the half point in the sky, midday. And then you have sunset. And then you have Asha. Islam connects you with nature. You, know, you see the crescent, and that's how you know the month of Ramadan has arrived. Mm -hmm. So that is very beneficial for your mental health. It keeps you close to nature, to purity. You appreciate the creation of God. You see the beauty, be the beauty of the horizon out there. Brother Neil, sometimes I'll be in a place where I'll see the sunset, or I'll see the sunrise, or I'll see the stars. I'm like, wow. We're yeah. living these days in these skyscrapers and buildings and basements, and we have no clue how beautiful nature is. The other day, I was just seeing the sunset here in Najaf. I almost cried. I'm like, wow, this is beautiful. I've not That's seen sunset in a long time. Look at wow. that. Isn't that a work of art? Doesn't yeah. this show you the, the, the beautiful creation of God? Islam connects you with nature. And then Islam connects you with psychology. It connects you with sociology. It connects you with economics. It connects you with politics. It connects you with mental health. It connects you with math uh, and uh, fractions and equations when it comes to inheritance and how you divide that. It literally connects you with every aspect of life. Non-Muslims should know how comprehensive and beautiful Islam is. And, mm -hmm. and, and mental health today is a big deal. It's yes. really a big deal. I feel, based on my research, that Islam really stands out out of all religions when it comes to addressing our mental health. Right now, it's the month of Ramadan, the month of worship, the month of spirituality, the month of generosity. You know, just our act of sujood. Islam is a religion that puts, places so much emphasis on sujood, prostration. Uh, Brother Neil, if you look at the medical aspect, the scientific aspect of prostration, what it does to your brain. One doctor, that's how he put it. You know, sujood massages your brain because of the pressure yeah. applies to the frontal lobe. That yes. gives you peace. That gives you security. Because when you're in sujood, your head is lower than your heart. So the mm. blood flows directly and, and, and more swiftly to the head. That in itself is amazing. The night prayer. Dua al-iftitah, Dua Abu Hamza Thamali, the collection of supplications that we have. This is literally an institution that protects your mental health, that gives you hope in life, that keeps you spiritual. So Islam really stands out when you look at the spiritual aspect and how Islam truly helps us with our mental health. That's sad. Really good points there, Sayyid. Now, thank you so much. And as we come into sort of the final points of the, the show, I mean, we've got probably 10 minutes or so left. I, I want to talk about us, because actions can sometimes speak louder than words, Sayyid. Now. And if we are in the faith, how should we be acting? We are the walking, talking catalogue of the Ahl Bayt, salam. We are the walking, talking Muslims. If you were to purchase something, you look at the catalogue first and you would choose your item but we are that catalog um what's our role and responsibility in terms of our actions to show uh humanity our our, our greatest attributes unfortunately in this air in this area we really have not done justice to islam to prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and to the ahl al-bayt um, these pristine teachings that they brought for humanity are not really reflected in, in many Muslims, unfortunately. And, you know, sometimes you just have to admit the reality. Uh, but, of course, over here, we're not just trying to judge, you know, uh, some Muslims. But we, 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 we want to highlight this so we can bring some change and to create awareness that the best way for you to introduce non-Muslims to Islam is through your actions. It's, it's through your character. You know, Prophet Muhammad wasallam during the 13 years that he was in Mecca, his priority was akhlaq. Mm -hmm. The Prophet wasn't going out there, you know, imposing law on people. Today you have a group of Muslims around the world, everywhere, in every community, in every masjid, in every mosque. You know, they are your um, police and lawyers going after you, trying to implement their law. 
slow down, slow down. Look at the legacy of your Prophet. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi attracted people to Islam in Mecca through his character, through honesty, through trustworthiness, yes. through integrity, through humbleness. These are values that we Muslims need to shine with to the world, such that when people think of honesty, they think of Muslims. Muslims really stand out when it comes to honesty. They're willing to even sacrifice their personal interests for the sake of honesty. Are we there? Are we at that yes. level yet? So it's very important through our actions, not through our preaching, to invite people to the religion of Islam. So look at the moral qualities the Prophet advocated for and trustworthiness, honesty, stand up. These are the defining feature of every Muslim. Such that, such that people feel safe, safe around the Muslim. Mm -hmm. Brother Neil, do you think today non-Muslims really feel their safest around the Muslim? Of course, that has a lot of factors. The media and the mm -hmm. Islamophobia out there does play a role. But yeah. honestly, do you think Muslims have created such an environment such that non-Muslims feel the safest with them, around them? You know, in all honesty, I think there's more work that needs to be done in this particular area. And uh, us as, as a, as a madhab, as a community, as an ummah, we can do more work to promote Islam in the most peaceful way. This because is how is Prophet like... Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi defines a Muslim. He says, Al-Muslimu man salim al-nasu min yadihi wa lisane. A Muslim is the one who people feel safe from his words, from his hands, meaning his actions. That's what defines a Muslim. You create safety for people. People feel safe with you. I think there are there's a lot to cover here. What can we as Muslims do? But I think if we all collectively take a step in making non-Muslims feel safe around us, mm -hmm. we will have introduced them to the religion of Islam. That's a very, very effective way to do so. Yeah, definitely. I think our attributes, the way that we are towards people, um, human beings pick up on energy. So they pick up on the calmness. They pick up on the tranquil nature uh, of us. And our religion is peace. It is nature. By nature, it's tranquility. As we said at the start of the show, one of the things that brought me to the religion was seeing the Jamaat prayer, seeing the tranquility of the movement of the prayer. And if we were able to show this beauty to non-Muslims through our actions, through the way that we are, the, our speech, our eloquency, holding the door open, looking after, seeing the elderly neighbor struggling with shopping and helping them. It's our actions that can help us push a little bit further. Just to kind of, as we're wrapping up in the show, dear Sayyidina, is there some practical tips that we can give our brothers and sisters in faith right now that they can think about and ponder about through the month of Ramadan so maybe they can make some changes to themselves and their, their brothers and sisters around them? I recommend to all of our brothers and sisters, choose one of the figures of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, like Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Imam Ali, Imam Zain al-Abidin, any of the Imams. Make it this your task in this month of Ramadan. And go and research their biography and see how they treated non-Muslims and how they interacted with non-Muslims. Every member of Ahlul Bayt interacted with non-Muslims. I want you to go in this month and do research yourself. Don't just listen to a speech here and there and that's it. Do your own research. Figure out how did Imam Sadiq salam interact with non-Muslims? How did Imam Hussein interact with non-Muslims? That will be very effective in guiding you what to do when you are in the presence of non-Muslims. Because each of these figures of the Ahlul Bayt, they are true role models for us. You know, how, how did they show the humanity of Islam? Um, you know, this, this really resonates with me all the time. Uh, once Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was sitting with his companions, when there was a funeral procession, a casket was being carried. So Prophet Muhammad, out of respect for the dead person, he stood up. His companions told him, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of God, why did you stand up? This deceased is not a Muslim. He's a Jewish person who died. 
Yeah. The prophet answered using two words, but they are so profound. An entire universe of teachings are found in these two words. The prophet yeah. said, Alayset nafsan. Isn't he a soul? What did the prophet say? Isn't he a soul? See, that's how he viewed non-Muslims. I'm not going to disrespect the body of this Jewish man because he's Jewish. Isn't he a soul? Is he a, isn't he a human being who has a soul? I would at least respect that. Let us Muslims be familiar with these examples of the Ahlul Bayt dealing with non-Muslims. Uh, I think that will give us so much inspiration to know um, how to introduce uh, Islam to them. Brilliant. That's amazing. I think that's something that we can take during this holy month um, and really reflect on and ponder on. Do our own research. Maybe look at the attributes of one of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam, or even the Prophet's life and really try to, you know, allow that to penetrate you and make positive changes. Because the month of Ramadan is about change. If you're going through the struggles of fasting, it's not just about coming out uh, into Shawal and you're just the same person. Something has to change from within. And maybe this is one way that we can do that. We can bring our beautiful religion to the, all so our brothers. So let's show these beautiful faith. teachings. Let's show the spirituality. Brother Neil, in many communities, what non-Muslims see in the month of Ramadan, I'm being very honest here. Please don't be upset with me. What they see in many communities is how much we eat and all the display of foods that we have. I'm being very honest. Some yeah. non-Muslims have even told me, yeah, Ramadan is when you have those feasts and those yeah. iftar dinners and all that good, delicious food. Okay, we yeah. should be hospitable. But that's not what Ramadan is about. Ramadan is about rising above your desires. It's about resisting temptation. It's not a month of indulgence where we show the non-Muslim world Ramadan is a time when, when we overeat and instead of, instead of having two dishes on the table, we have 20 dishes on the table. <laughs> very true. Very, very true. Um, yeah, so, li li you know, th there's, in, in coaching we say, think twice and act once. So this is how we need to be. Our actions our sh will show our brothers and sisters in faith the beautiful religion. So you're right in saying that, uh, dear saying, uh, and, and there's nothing to forgive, honestly. You are right in saying that. We should be more hospitable and show the world this beautiful religion that we have, inshallah. Um, thank you so, so much for your time, Sayyid. And we learned so much and, you know, we unpacked so much as well, inshallah. Thank you so much for joining us. It has been my honor to be on this show once again. I congratulate you and our dear viewers on the beautiful month of Ramadan. May Allah make it a spiritually uplifting month. May Allah accept our deeds in this blessed month. And I will pray for all of you. Uh, tonight here in the blessed city of Najaf um, in the shrine of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam.